The town people could hear him screaming at night. No one, talk, no one ever walked through the graveyard by themselves, especially at night. Uh, they knew he wasn't a ghost because some of them had been attacked physically by him. He was a horrifying sight to behold. He had uh, damage to his wrist and to his ankles from the chains that had bound him that he had broken free from. He had scars all over his body from the beatings that he had taken from the townspeople. He was naked as a jaybird and he was possessed by thousands of demons. And this man meets Jesus and the 12 disciples as soon as they get out of the boat. Now we're going to go back to that in just a minute, but we first have to meet the men in the boat who are in the storm. These guys are seasoned fishermen. They know when there is great danger, and they knew that they were in great danger. And they had become extremely afraid, and so they wake Jesus up, and like the sloth in Ice Age, he goes, we're going to die! And uh, Jesus wakes up, and he rebukes the wind, he rebukes the waves, everything becomes calm, and the 12 are now more afraid than they ever were because they start asking the question, who is this man who can speak to the wind and the waves and everything becomes calm? Who is this man? Now, I personally believe that Jesus set this up. I believe that if Jesus could have sent the flood back in Noah's day, it would be no problem for him to send a storm. And even if he didn't send the storm, he was going to use this storm to teach them a lesson. Now, in order to understand the lesson, we have to understand the context. Luke is writing the history of Jesus' life and ministry. And in writing this history of Jesus' life and ministry, he's trying to emphasize how important it is for us to have faith. And our faith needs to be in Jesus, and we have to understand who Jesus is in order to make our faith real. None of the stories that Luke tells in his gospel are there to stand by themselves, although they do. But were there to be understood within the context of everything that Luke is writing and trying to say about Jesus and our faith and who Jesus is. Let me just give you a quick overview of what we've learned about faith. In Luke 4, Jesus goes to his hometown and he says to them, I am the Messiah. And this is how you need to respond to that. And the townspeople say, oh, wait a second. Who are you to tell us how to live? And they grab him and they drag him out of the city and they're going to throw him off a cliff and stone him to death. And Jesus disappears. And Jesus' response was he marveled at their lack of faith. And then there were these four friends who had their friend who was paralyzed. And so they bring him to Jesus and the ceiling's beginning to crumble around Jesus. Debris is falling on Jesus. All of a sudden there's a hole there and a man is being dropped down through the hole. And Jesus looks up and he goes, one, two, three, four. Four faces, big smiles, full of faith. And Jesus, because of their faith, heals this paralyzed man. And then in Luke 7, we hear about a Roman centurion who is the great symbol of oppression over the people of Israel. And he has a dying servant that he loves, and he's asked if Jesus would come and heal his servant. And Jesus says, yes, he'll come. So Jesus is on his way, and the centurion realizes, man, Jesus doesn't need to be here. All Jesus needs to do is say the word, and my servant will be healed. And so he sends word to Jesus, you don't have to come, just say it, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus' response is this, I have not found faith, like this in all of the sons of Israel. And then in Luke 7, there's a story of the prostitute and the religious leaders. And the religious leaders are wash, watching a woman wash the feet of Jesus with her tears in gratitude because her sins have been forgiven. Now, the religious leaders haven't gotten who Jesus is yet, but this prostitute knows. And Jesus says to her, your faith has saved you. 
go in peace. And then there's Luke 8, where Jesus teaches the parable of the soils. And there are four kinds of soils, but there's only one soil that produces fruit to maturity, and that's called the good soil. And a person who has good soil is a person who has faith enough to hear the word of God and believes it enough to practice it. And now Jesus has the in crowd, those 12 men he has chosen to be his apostles. He has them in a boat, and he's going to help them find out about their lack of faith. He's going to help them find out that they don't have what it takes yet to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. They are entering into a, a teaching moment. And it is the same lesson that is directed at us. When the storms of life hit, where is your faith? And who is your faith in? Now we've read the story of the storm. We learn a few things. Number one, obedience can lead us out of or into storms. Uh, these disciples are in the middle of a storm because they were doing exactly what Jesus had asked them to do. He said, let's go to the other side. And so they got in the boat and they were on their way to the other side. And then all of a sudden the storm arises and they think they're going to die. Listen carefully. People... You and I can follow Jesus Christ. We can do exactly what Christ asks us to do every minute of the day and still find ourselves in the middle of a real storm. And some people can truly say, I'm following Jesus, but my life really stinks. Uh, there aren't too many praise songs today that uh, talk about, hallelujah, I'm following Jesus and my life stinks. You know one like that? Yeah, there isn't one. We have a hallelujah, and we have our God is an awesome God, but you know, when was the last time you heard us stand up, I'm following Jesus, and my life stinks. You know, we don't have it. It's not there. People, you can follow Jesus, do exactly what he says, and find yourself in what we'll consider a hopeless situation. And that is where... Our faith needs to kick in. Now, storms reveal who we are and who God is. The disciples had just learned about the good soil, that it represents an open heart, and that an open heart hears God's word and believes it and practices it. And so they heard Jesus say, get in the boat, and so they got in the boat, and now they're in the middle of the storm. And they waited until the situation appeared absolutely hopeless, and then they woke Jesus up with, we're going to die. And uh, Jesus, they came to Jesus at the end of the situation as a last resort, waking him up and saying, Master, we're going to die in about 30 seconds. Uh, would you like to know? You know, the, the Messiah is going to go to the bottom of the ocean with us. Now, they said, Master, Master. But they didn't understand who was in the boat with them. They really didn't, or they wouldn't have said, we're going to die. Listen carefully. Storms reveal who we are. Whether or not we're men or women of faith. And storms also reveal who you believe Jesus is. Now remember this. It's not the amount of your faith. It's the object of your faith. You don't have to have a lot of faith. But you have to have faith in the right person. They were in the horrifying storm. They wake Jesus up. He stands up. He rebukes the wind and the wave. Instantly the wind stops. Instantly the sea becomes calm. And then Jesus looks at the men and he says, where was your faith? And the disciples are now even more afraid. And they ask this question, who is this? that even the wind and the waves obey him. Now the storm that they were in was an up and close, close and personal. It was a one-on-one -on -one lesson 
that Jesus brought to them. And Jesus was really asking these guys in this situation, do you guys have faith yet? Who is your faith in? Do you even know who I am? Could you trust me? And I hear the disciples saying, well, um, we didn't know you could do that. I picture Jesus sitting down with these guys later on and saying to the guys, listen, let me ask you a question. What is a bigger storm? To be on the rough seas where you think you're going to die or being a widow whose only son has died? And they go, being a widow. And Jesus says, and what did I do for that widow? Oh, you raised her son from the dead. And then Jesus looking at them and saying, I didn't hear you say, who is this man? And then Jesus looking at them and saying, I know why. It wasn't your storm. And then I look at Jesus saying to them, what, what, what's, what's a bigger situation? What's a bigger storm? Having your body covered with oozing leprosy without any hope or being caught in the storm on the sea? And their response is, eh, leprosy. And Jesus says, and what did I do with the leper? Well, you healed him. Well, I didn't hear you say, who is this guy that did that? Uh, I remember, it's not your storm. Or what is a greater Difficulty. What is a greater storm? Being a paralyzed man in the first century or being in a boat that you think is going to sink? And I hear the guy saying, being paralyzed in the first century. And Jesus saying, what did I do with that man? And they looked at him and said, well, he spoke the word. He got up and he walked. And Jesus looking at the guys and saying, well, how come he didn't say who is this guy? meaning me, and then Jesus saying, oh, I remember, it's not your storm. Here's my point. Every one of us go through storms, but the storm you go through is your storm. The disciples hadn't been through a personal storm with Jesus yet, and now they're in the storm. Now they're being rocked by the storm, They had seen everything Jesus had done up to then, but it wasn't their storm. And it hadn't registered with them who Jesus was up to then. And Jesus says, this personal storm is going to help you discover who I am and that you can trust me. People, listen. It is a huge difference knowing Jesus is in the boat and knowing the Jesus who is in the boat. It's one thing to know God is with me. It's another thing to know the God who is with me. Back, a, back in 2010, our church went through a financial crisis. And some of you came up to me after a meeting, you had tears in your eyes, and you asked the question, is our church going to survive? Are we going to still be a church? And, and I looked at you with confidence, and I said, yes, everything's going to be okay. You may ask, well, how do you know that, Dave? How do you know everything's going to be okay in this situation? Because God had brought Jeanette and me through some personal financial crises. And I not only knew that the Bible said that Jehovah God was Jehovah Jireh, our provider, but I had experienced him as my Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Give you, I may have told this story to you before, but when I started the painting business, I didn't have a clientele, I didn't have anybody to go to get jobs for, so I advertised that I would paint for $8 an hour. But I needed $500 a week to live on. And eight times 40 hours a week is only $320. And so I needed, I was only going to make $320, and I needed five, and I didn't know how to do it, so I just presented it to God. The church that I was going to was Willowdale Chapel. And um, I 
never shared the situation with anyone. Never told anybody how much I needed to make. Never told anybody how much I was charging. Never told them I was going to come up short every week. But I came every Sunday after church. I would come to my car, and there would be an envelope with cash in it. Now, this is not a lie. This is true. And I can't give you the exact numbers because it's like 20 years ago. But if I made $320 that week, in that envelope was $180 in cash. If I made $420 that week, in that envelope was $80 cash. If I made $250 that week, there would be $250 cash in that envelope. It was always exactly the $500. What I made and what they put in that envelope was exactly $500 a week. And when I finally raised my rates to $12.50 an hour, which converts to $500 a week, the envelope stopped. I should have gone back to the envelopes. <laughs> I never found out who it was that gave it. I never... I, Asked around to find out what was happening. Was it a Sunday school class or whatever? I don't know. But what I discovered was that Jehovah Jireh was my Jehovah Jireh. He was my provider and that God would meet my needs. And so I was able to say to this church that God is our Jehovah Jireh. He will provide. This is just a test of our faith. The disciples knew that the Son of God was in the boat, but they didn't know the Son of God who was in the boat. They still had a long way to go. They hadn't gotten it yet. They were in the boat with the one they called Master, but they didn't really know who he was. But I promise you, they're going to get it because they're going to see him heal the sick and Give sight to the blind and make the lame walk and the deaf hear and the mute see and the leprosy go away and he's going to raise the dead. They were going to get it. You say, what were they going to get? That Jesus was God. They were going to begin to understand that. Now faith is trusting God enough to do what he says and knowing that he is in charge of the journey. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. They trusted Jesus enough to get into the boat, started to the other side. They, Jesus did not say, let's try to get to the other side. Jesus didn't say, let's see if we can make it. These guys got in the boat. There was no fear. There was no storm. Jesus was with them. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the journey, the storm comes up. It's a huge storm. They appear to be in serious danger. They go to Jesus with master, master. Now listen carefully. They had the first two words right. Master, master, or Lord, Lord. But the next words show that they didn't trust him when they said to him, we're going to die. They didn't really know who he was. And when we go through a storm and we cry out to Jesus, Lord, Lord, that is a great beginning. But what Jesus wants us to do is say to him, Lord, Lord, the storm is raging and I need your help handling my heart and my mind. I need you more than I ever needed you. This is the biggest storm that I've ever encountered. Help me to keep my focus on you because I know that you're in charge of the storm. Now you sit back and you say, well, Dave, what's the faith supposed to look like? I'm glad you asked that question. The minute they rowed the boat ashore, I wanted to do this. Jesus rowed the boat ashore, hallelujah. I didn't even put that down there, but I wanted to do that anyhow. Uh, Jesus and the 12 disciples get out of the boat, and immediately they're met by a demon-possessed man. Marks on his wrists and his ankles from the chains that couldn't contain him. He is stark naked and he's screaming. And I see the disciples cowering together in a little huddle saying, let's get back in the boat. The storm wasn't that bad. And uh, this is quite a scene. 
And I titled it in your notes, Pigs and Tombs and Demons and Nakedness. And if you want to read something about this, you can read Leviticus chapter 11. You're not allowed to have those things. Anyhow, there's nothing dirtier than a pig. And this man lived in the tombs, so he was unclean and he was defiled. He was naked, so he had no dignity. He was demon-possessed, and so he had no soundness of mind. He was a wacko. He was nuts. And this man is as far gone as anybody could be gone And you would never expect to find good soil in this man's heart. But Jesus is about to show his disciples that you can find faith and good soil in the most unlikely places. You remember Jesus didn't find faith in his hometown, but he did find faith in a Roman centurion. He didn't find faith among the religious leaders, but he found faith in the prostitute. And he didn't find faith in his disciples in the midst of their storm, but they were going to find that there was faith in the heart of a man who was possessed by the demons, one of the most vilest of all men. The man came to Jesus. Now, I want you to understand something. The demons did not bring this man to Jesus because the demons did not want to be in the presence of Jesus. This man came to Jesus, and then the demons began to speak through this man. And basically they said, hey, what do you want from us? Please don't torture us. Please don't send us into the abyss. Please let us go to those pigs over there. Jesus granted their request. The pigs run down the hill. They jump off the cliff. They go into the sea. Pigs can't swim. They all die. You got the Bay of Pigs. Thought I'd do that. And um, when the town people finally arrive at the scene, they see this formerly demon-possessed man sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed, and in his right mind. Now, somebody's going to say, fully clothed? Did we have a miracle of clothing take place here? I don't know. Probably one of the disciples had an extra tunic, said, hey, the town people are coming. You might be more comfortable having a tunic on now that you're not demon-possessed. And by the way, you tie it like this, just in case you forgot how to get dressed. And, And so the town people come, and here's this man sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed, and he is in his right mind. Listen, there were a legion of demons in this man. Those demons were cast out from this man, A Roman legion could be anywhere from 4,000 to 6,000 soldiers. I don't know if the demon was trying to say there were 4,000 to 6,000 demons there, but there were a lot of them. And in Mark it says that that the demons entered 2,000 pigs, and those pigs became possessed by demons and went out and committed suicide. Listen carefully. There are many people who would just love to be happy with Jesus just restoring their dignity. There are some people who have been so scarred by sin, whether or not it's their own sin or the sin of others that was creating havoc in their life and they lost their dignity, they would be so excited if Jesus would come and restore their dignity. And then there are people today who would love for Jesus just to give them soundness of mind. I sat in a Bible study 20-some years ago that I was teaching, and there was a man there, and he said to the group, he says, I hear demons speaking all the time. Don't do this. Don't believe that. Do this. If I could just silence the demons from speaking to me, I would be in peace for this man in this story. The demons no longer were speaking to him. And he had soundness of mind. You know what the Bible says? It's when you have the Holy Spirit, he gives you the spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. That's what Jesus does. God's authority brings freedom 
It, not bondage and not oppression. It brings freedom. And this man had not known freedom in his life. He only knew bondage and oppression from years of being oppressed. And all of a sudden, he meets the Son of the Most High God, and he finds total freedom. Once he was bound in chains and controlled by demons, and now he is free. While he was bound, he ran to Jesus for help. And Jesus helped him and cast out the demons. And the demons went into the pigs, and the pigs went off the cliff. And you ask the question, why is that in the story? Who cares where the demons went? There are a lot of reasons you could come up with, but I think the greatest one is this. This man one day was going to wake up and he was going to begin to ask himself the question, did this really happen? You know, was I really possessed by those demons? Did I really run around naked all the time? Did I really terrorize the people? Having seen all of a sudden this freedom come to his life and these pigs possessed by demons running off a cliff and dying would have been a visual thing that he would never forget. And he would say, oh yeah, I saw the pigs. That did happen. I am free. And people, Jesus frees people. Jesus liberates, and once he frees you and liberates you, you will never forget how he did it. Now, the townspeople, they come to Jesus, and they say, hey, the pigs were our livelihood. He took away our possessions. And they say to Jesus, because their hearts are hard, because their hearts are bad soil, we don't want to hear your teachings. We're not interested in what you have to say. Go away. And Jesus leaves. Listen to what it says in verse 37. Then all the people in the region of the Gerizines asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got in the boat and left. And the man from whom the demons had gone out begged, begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all the town how much Jesus had done from him, for him. Listen carefully. Faith begins with accepting a no to our plans and our desires. Faith begins with accepting a no to our plans and our desires. The disciples got in the boat to leave. Jesus got in the boat to leave. This demon possessed, this formerly demon possessed man. He looks at the people who had chained him and beat him, who don't want anything to do with Jesus, and he looks at Jesus and he says, I got to go with Jesus. I want to be his disciple. And he starts to get in the boat, and Jesus says, you can't get in the boat. I want you to stay here, and I want you to go back to your home, and I want you to go back to your town, and I want you to tell the people how much God has done for you. I'm empowering you to go. I'm asking you to be my witness. Go and tell Tell the people that the Son of the Most High God has power over the unseen spiritual world. And the man goes. And I picture him going into towns and he walks up to a couple people and says, look at my, my wrist, see the marks from the chains? And look at my ankles and see the marks from the chain. And look at the welts on my back and from the beatings that I took from you guys. But let me tell you, the most wonderful day that ever happened in my life was when I met Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, and he cast all those demons out of me. And look at me, I, I'm clothed, I, I follow Jesus, I have my dignity back, I have my sanity back. But he wanted to go with Jesus. But he did what Jesus told him to do. This man was in the lowest place of his life. And then he met Jesus. And Jesus changed his life. And this man in faith goes and tells what Jesus says. He trusted Jesus enough to do what Jesus said to do. Why did Jesus asked the man to go back and tell his town what had happened. Because Jesus knew the story that this man would tell would get the people's attention. And when they heard his story, 
from his lips, their hearts would move from hard hearts to softened hearts. And they'd be ready to hear the story that Jesus wanted to tell them. And you say to me, well, how do you know that? That's not said in that story. But later on in Luke, we're going to hear another story. That when Jesus returned to the Gerasenes, he was met by 5,000 men and their wives and their children, and they didn't have any food. And Jesus tells them to sit down, and he feeds them with a little kid's box lunch of five loaves and two fishes. And so what had happened was this man's story changed their hearts And now they were ready to hear Jesus say, this is what you need to do. I'm the Messiah, follow me. And if you remember what we said last week when we talked about the soils, is this. No matter what the soil is in your heart, the soil can change. We don't know what it is that's going to bring about that change, but the soil can change. So let me wrap it up, but don't wrap up your minds, okay? Listen to what i got to say. Why did Jesus take his disciples on a stormy boat ride and then to a cemetery with a demon-possessed man in it? The answer is he wanted his disciples to see what faith looked like. If Jesus says, go and tell, faith goes and tells. If Jesus says, let's go to the other side in a boat, faith believes that they're going to go all the way to the other side in the boat. And they're going to, faith is going to trust Jesus for the journey. But if you never have that kind of faith, you'll never have that kind of faith unless you know who Jesus is. He also wanted his disciples to know who he was. And so they heard a demon-possessed man say to them in their presence, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, leave us alone. Who better to know who the Son of the Most High God was but the demons who used to live with him in glory who got cast out as fallen angels. And then the Son of the Most High God had the power to calm the fiercest of storms and also the fiercest of demonic storms. The disciples saw it. They were beginning to get the picture that Jesus is God. Some of you already have that faith. You got it. You've had an encounter with the Son of the Most High. He has given you forgiveness. He's given you dignity. He's given you a sound mind. You have a testimony of how Jesus touched your life, how he made you a son or a daughter. What you need to do is go and tell people. Perhaps your testimony will soften their hearts to hear the truth. Others of you may not be there yet. You aren't really sure who Jesus is. You really, you know a little bit about Jesus, but you haven't yet gotten to know Jesus. And there isn't any way that you're going to do what he says because you don't know who he is. And you know that makes perfect sense to me. But I want you also to know that even at the end of these two stories, the disciples still hadn't got it. They don't get it for a while. But when they do get it, Jesus changes their lives. So I want to ask you, if you're still wondering who Jesus is, you got to keep coming back Sunday after Sunday and learn about this Jesus. Because I promise you that when we get done this series, you are going to know not only who Jesus is, but you're going to have the opportunity to experience this Jesus in your life. I want us to stand and have a word of prayer. I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. And we're going to sing that song, Mighty to Save, all the way through. Okay? Let's pray together. Father, um, some of us here in this room have been through incredible storms. And the only way we made it was we had to grab a hold of you and know that you were the God who was in charge. Even if we didn't like the outcome... We were going to trust you. That's real faith. And there's only one way that we have that type of real faith, 
And that is if we know that Jesus is God. And we can't say it was the storm had a happy ending, or we can't say that the storm worked out the way we wanted it to, but we still had faith in you, and you are God, and you never make a mistake, even though we wonder at times. But that's faith. When you say no, faith listens and obeys. It's willing to allow you to change our plans and our desires, even though we don't want to. That's great faith. And I thank you for the strong faith that people in this church have. But I think of others that may be still searching, still looking, still questioning, uh, who is this Jesus and why should I believe him and why should I let him in my boat? And even if I do let him in the boat, what difference will that make in my life? I pray, Lord, that you will work either through these sermons or through these sermons and a lot of other situations to bring them to a place where Jesus becomes known to them personally as the Son of the Most High God. And that they'll know that he's not just the Son of the Most High God in their boat, but they'll know the Son of the Most High God who is in the boat. Thank you, Lord, for how you're working in our lives, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.